Praise the Lord. They could never actually prove that. Yeah, we, we don't have any video. <laughs> That's right. Praise the Lord. Well, it's good to be here again since we live here. It's always good to be here, right? <clears throat> Let's open the word of God. Had a good talk earlier from uh, Pastor Ben. That was good. We're going to go into Hebrews chapter 11. Now, the scriptures are amazing, right? Because we can go from Genesis to uh, Jude and read about a number of different miracles, a number of different testimonies, people stepping out in faith. It is just amazing. Now, I've got a new Bible and these pages are sticking together. So um, it's amazing to see how people have believed in God, trusted in God, wanted to trust in God. They were given direction, and they stepped out in faith. And whenever people have done that with God's direction in mind, great things have happened at some point. Sometimes it was a little challenging at first. Sometimes they had to go through trials. Sometimes they had to deal with the people or the nations around about. But in the end, it was always an incredible blessing when they followed that path that the Lord laid down, when they stepped out in faith. And sometimes it goes against our nature to step out in faith. Sometimes it goes against our nature to be given direction. And we look at something and say, I don't want to go in that direction. That's not a... That's not a good direction. I had a situation where I went skydiving. Well, I went skydiving, but I went scuba diving many years ago. We were, we were. I've always wanted to learn, and so I went through the um, the course, instruction course on scuba diving. Well, one of the um, segments was a deep dive, and during this deep dive, and it was right off here, right off of Seattle in Redondo Beach. So I could say it was in Redondo Beach, but not the one in California. Right, because it was warm down there. Here it was cold, the water is. And so it was a deep dive. And the instructor was saying there was four of us. There's the instructor was saying, This is what we're going to do. We're standing on land in all of our gear. I said, We're gonna we're gonna get in the water, we're gonna swim out to this buoy right here at the end of the pier. And then where that buoy is, we're gonna drop right straight down to the bottom, and it's only about 25 or 30 feet. But then there's a rope attached to the ocean floor at that point. And it goes down deep to about about 100 uh, about 100 feet, 120 feet. And uh, just so so he's explaining this, right? We're up on in safe up on dry ground, breathing air. And he says, he, we'll, "We'll drop down, we'll grab hold of this rope, and we'll follow the rope all the way down to the end." And it's a 120 foot dive was our uh, depth we had to get to and show that we would acclimate and that we wouldn't you know lose it, but could control and swim, swim around do a little exploration and come back what he failed to tell us was that it was a highly traveled path down this um and so we knew kind of the basics and he says okay this is what we're going to do let's swim out and let's go so we did we put our gear on we swam out we got down to the bottom and we're going down this rope where there was a lot of people that had gone before us and kicked up dust and debris and so you could hold on to the rope and you could kind of kick and and follow and the instructor was there he was about three feet, about a meter away, and you couldn't hardly see him because it was it was the visibility was just horrible. And so we get all the way down to the bottom, and it was myself and my partner, and then two other girls that were in front of us. And so all five of us were working our way down. And the two girls that were in front of us got to the bottom. And so you can imagine this rope, right, that goes all the way down, tethered at both points. And the deep end, there they got all the way to the bottom, and, and there's no more rope. So they're kind of holding on to this last little bit. Well, here we come, right? And we're kind of crowded down by this, this little tether at the end. But that was our launching off point, he called it. So at that point, the, the four of us are all snuggled up there, right? Holding on, not letting go of the rope, because you can't see more than three feet in front of you. And here's the instructor on the other side of the rope. You can barely see him. And, and you can't talk, right? Because you can't hear it. So he gives the he gives us the sign. Let go of the rope and come to me. And I'm thinking, 
no way. This is my secure line. I know where I'm at right here. Right? I do not want to let go of the rope. And he had to do it a few times, let go of the rope and come to me. And the two girls that were in front of us, they didn't let go. But my partner and myself, you know, we let go and kind of would swim and kept focus on where he was. And we got about 10 feet and it all opened up. It was clear. You can see as big as this room. You can see 30, 40 feet. It was like, oh, this is cool. Oh, this is great. But I remember that feeling of him saying, let go and come to me. And sometimes it's like that walking in the Lord. The Lord says, this is the path I want you to go. And you go down that path and you go, I think this is as far as I want to go. I don't want to go any further. But stepping out in faith, there are great things in the Lord. There are great things that the Lord gives when we step out in faith following his path. So the end of that story was, just quickly sort of wrap it up. The end of the story is my partner and I, we're, we're out there and the instructor's there and we're going through all the routine, right? How much air do you have? Okay, we're looking at our air tank. Okay, we, you know, give them sign uh, signals how much air we have left. And okay, you, you're good, you're good, you okay? Yeah, yeah, we're okay. And we're coherent, we're, we're seeing everything. And the two girls aren't there. So. And so we're sitting there and, you know, we're kind of going back and forth and, and, and we're kind of like, oh, all of a sudden it dawned on us all at the same time, we're the two girls. And we all looked back into the cloud of yuck, right? And so the instructor says, you guys stay here. I'm going to go and I'll be right back. And at that point, I wanted to say no, right? What can you say? So, okay, well, we'll stay here. So we're sitting there, we're waiting, we're staying. And the instructor goes and doesn't come back. And so here, my partner and I, we're sitting here at 120 feet down on the ocean floor, sitting on the bottom, sort of trying to stay warm because now it's starting to get cold. We're not moving around. And the instructor's gone to get the other two girls so he can come back so we could do our little explore, exploration around and come back. Well, he doesn't come back. And he doesn't come back. And it must have been, I mean, it felt like an hour, right? It was probably only a couple of minutes, but it felt like an hour and it's like, Oh, what are we going to do? And she looked at me and I looked at her. She's like, what are we going to do? And I said, oh, okay, okay, we're good on our air, right? Let's, let's, all the training kicks in now, right? Make sure you got enough air in your tank. Make sure you're not panicking. Make, make sure everything's okay. I said, well, we got enough air. Let's, let's wait. Let's wait. He didn't come back. He didn't come back. And it got to a point where our air was getting low. And so she's looking at me like, I could see it in her eyes, right? And it was probably in my eyes too. Panic. What are we going to do now? And I said, oh, okay. I said, let's go back to the rope. We'll grab hold of the rope. And she goes, okay, I'll follow you. <laughs> I don't know what the little rope is. <laughs> so by faith, we turned around. You know, obviously, I'm praying in the spirit, right? I turned around and get back into the muck. And you can't see anything again. And it's all sort of, and, and all of a sudden, there was the rope. And I was like, yes, oh, praise the Lord, right? So we made our ascent back up and did our, our stops at the level to, so we didn't get the bends, that sort of thing. And so we made it up to the top and we broke, you know, the, the surface of the water. And it was like, yes, we did it. You know, we didn't die. And it was sort of like, this is cool. We, we survived a, a catastrophe in a sense. Could have been pretty bad. And so we're kind of there and all right. And then all of a sudden, there's the two girls. They're up on the top of the water, just kind of bobbing around, hanging around. And we're like, oh, oh, hey, hey, where's our instructor? Our instructor went back down looking for us. Right. And so anyways, he came up later. And we all got together and he was really shaken up and we were all excited and stepping out in faith. Sometimes you don't want to let go of that rope. But the scriptures tell us that when we step out in faith, doing God's will, he never leaves us, never forsakes us. So I want to talk a little bit about faith this morning. Let's go where it should be in Hebrews chapter 11. I should probably grab my notes to make sure. Oh, man, that wasn't part of the notes. Now I got to shave off some brand of pain. <laughs> uh, let's start in verse 1. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. This is the faith chapter you probably all know. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Another translation says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the sign that the things not seen are true. And when God tells us to step out in faith or encourages us to step out in faith, what he's trying to say is, I want to build your faith. I want to build you up, but you have to learn to trust me. And there's a lot of trust that goes into 
stepping out in faith. And so when the scriptures are talking about here, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. We can hope to get to the kingdom of heaven one day. We can hope to get the victory over this situation. We can hope to, to, to see whatever situation in our life is going on when we pray and we step out in faith for the Lord. We all operate on faith every day that you probably don't even re realize or recognize, right? You're driving your car, you're coming along to a red light, you hit this little pedal down at the bottom, and the car stops. Well, you've got faith that you hit this pedal and your car is going to stop. But some may not even understand what goes on in that with the fluid inside. When you hit the pedal and it pushes the fluid and the cylinder expands and it goes down and all these things are expanding. So the faith that we have when we hit the brakes is that the car is going to stop. The faith that we have when it's cold and we go to a dial on the wall and turn the dial up, that the heat's going to come not understanding how all the, the components where the electricity goes through and the gas goes through and it heats up. But we know because we deal with that every day. But what about all the complexity that goes behind when God says, step out in faith over here for me and I will not let you down. That's where we need to really say, do I trust the Lord? How do I trust the Lord? How do I want to trust the Lord? Do I want to say yes? Let's go or not. In verse 7, down in verse 7 of Hebrew 11, by faith, Noah being warned of God, the things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteous, which is by faith. When God spoke with Noah, and however that happened, God was able to convince Noah in such a way that there was going to be a flood. And Noah had never seen rain. And up until that time on the earth, the rain hadn't come down. It was sort of a mist that went around and watered the, the earth. But Noah could be thinking, what do you mean a flood? What do you mean a boat? I've never even heard of a boat, maybe, right? But God spoke to Noah and said, look, I want to save you and your family because you're a righteous man. So I need you to build this boat. That's going to house all of these. Well, he didn't question. He did. Noah just did it. And we know as we read through the stories that he was able to save his house, the eight souls and all the animals. In verse six is key. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is, that is God is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So to serve God, we must have faith. We must have faith to be able to say, yes, I'll follow. Yes, Lord, I trust you. I trust that you're not going to lead me into a bad situation, but I trust that you're going to lead me into a good and a better situation that's going to be able to glorify your name. Romans chapter 8. Let's go back to the book of Romans. So faith takes and plays a big part in our life, in serving God, walking with the Lord, being a Christian, um, walking righteously, whatever name you'd like to put on that, but being part of God's family, faith is crucial. It is crucial that we step out in faith for him. In Romans chapter 8, in just in verse 24 here, Paul writes and he says, for we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope for what a man sees. Why does he yet hope for? But if we hope for that, we see not the kingdom of heaven. Then do we with patience wait for it. God has promised us eternal life. God has promised that his son is returning in the clouds to gather his elect. God has promised if you repent, and if you get baptized in water by full immersion, I will give you the Holy Spirit and your life will be changed. You will be adopted into my family. You will be my son and my daughter and heirs and joint heirs with Christ. If you have faith, repent and get baptized, I will give you that Holy Ghost. And then what's the promise from there? The kingdom of heaven. That kingdom of heaven where there's no more tears. We've read in Revelations. 
no more fears, no more pain, no more suffering, but great joy. Have you guys ever wondered what heaven's going to look like? As adults, it's kind of boring, right? But as kids, ask kids, ask a, ask a young child, what do you think heaven's going to be? I can remember, so I didn't grow up in a family that was religious, right? We didn't go to church. My par grandparents did, and every once in a while we'd go with them. And I'd heard about this heaven, right? You want to get to heaven. Well, I can still remember what my vision of heaven was when I was probably five, six, seven, eight or so, and I could hear them talk about it. And my vision of heaven at that age was, uh, well, you know how big Costco is, right? And it's, a, it's a huge place. And Home Depot. And we'll put about 10 of those together, right? This huge building. And heaven to me is when you enter the gates of heaven at that age, my vision was you're walking into the door of this huge, massive building. And there's bicycles and tricycles and wagons and toys and all manner of things to play with. And there was no time limit and nothing was out of bounds. That was my version of heaven, right? I mean, that's, I was a kid, but I mean, how, how, as a kid, that's exciting. That's joy. That's, man, I don't want to go there, right? Well, as an adult, what's your, what's your version of kingdom of heaven? I would recommend you look at it as a child's view. It's a lot more fun. We tend to be more logical. And that's, mm -hmm. But it's, either way, it's going to be a good place, the kingdom of heaven. Um, let's go to uh, Matthew chapter 14. It's amazing what you think about as kids and, and, and why I would ever even you know, thought of that. But anyways, Matthew chapter 14. This is kind of the story that I really wanted to get to and kind of pull it all together on how do we apply faith in our life. And how do we apply faith when we know and see things and uh, should be walking by faith and not by sight? In Matthew 11, uh, sorry, did I say 11? I meant 14. Matthew 14, in a verse 22, we'll start. Jesus had been preaching and talking to, to people and, and uh, parables and showing miracles and doing incredible things. Well, it get, got to a point where Jesus came to his disciples and in verse 24, he says, um, but uh, sorry, where am I at? 24? 22. We'll start in verse 22. And straightway, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him on the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And we had sent, when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. So there's two different things I want to look at here. One of them is, as Pastor Ben said earlier, about praying, kneeling and praying. Jesus did a lot of praying. He wanted to stay connected with the Father. And we know in Jude, it says, you build up yourselves on your most, most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, praying in tongues. And so this is Jesus. He sent the disciples away in a ship. He's gone up to pray, to rebuild, to get strength, whatever it was focusing on, and in verse 25, or did we get to 25? Yeah, 25, um, 24, sorry, verse 24. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, which is about three o'clock, three to six o'clock in the morning, about the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, his disciples, walking on the water. So here comes Jesus walking on the water. His disciples Put yourself in the boat of the disciples, right? If you've ever been in a boat, it's a lot of fun. If you've ever been in a motorboat, water skiing, wakeboarding, it's a lot of fun. Especially on a nice sunny day, it's warm, the seas are calm, the lake's calm, whatever it is. It's a lot of fun. But when the wind starts picking up and the storm starts coming and the waves start to get choppier, if you've ever been out in the ocean, it can be pretty darn scary. I did some fishing up in Alaska, commercial fishing, and one of the days, one of the trips we took coming back, we hit 14-foot seas, which is probably a little taller than the ceiling here, right? 14-foot waves, and we were in a 44-foot boat, which is smaller than this room, and we were, as it says, tossed around. We were tossed around. We were all seasick that day. But the disciples are there. They've just seen these miracles Jesus had done. He just fed the 5,000, and they, they're sent away, and they're in the boat, and they're rowing to go to the other side, following the direction of Jesus. They're halfway across, maybe. They're in the middle. The wind, everything's boisterous. The, the waves are sloshing in, and they're thinking, maybe we should have taken a Uber 
rather than a boat across, right? They're starting to maybe doubt and think. And Jesus had his own plan going. And he's just cruising across the water, and now I've got to get meet my boys on the other side, right? And so there's fear in the boat. There's cold in the boat. There's wind in the boat. There's water. Everyone's wet. I mean, so you can, it's not a fun, it's not a fun time. Pick it up in verse 26. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it is a spirit. And they cried for fear. So they thought, oh, man, we're, we're, we're close to death now. This is it. You know, here comes the angel to take us away or whatever they might have been thinking. But they were afraid. They didn't recognize Jesus. And then in verse 27, but straightway Jesus spoke to them, saying, be of good cheer. It is I. Don't be afraid. Jesus, the comforter. Look, I've got things under control. Guy knows, guys, no problem. You know, I'm, I'm coming over. I'm going to help you row. We're going to call him the seas, whatever the case may be. In verse 28, and Peter answered and said unto him, Lord, if it be thou, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. If it be thou, it's fear, it's cold, it's windy, maybe starting a little seasick coming in, a little nauseous, right? They're seeing this. This man on the water thinking it's a ghost, a spirit, thinking maybe this is it. You know, we're going to go to the gates, whatever the case may be. And Peter says, if it's you, ask me to come to you. Now, Peter was a fisherman all his life. And Peter knew that when you fall out of the boat, you sink unless you swim. So there's no way the water's going to hold you. There would have been many, many days, I'm sure, that Peter would have jumped in the water because of the heat or fallen in the water, tossed from the boat. And so Peter knew, without a doubt, as soon as he got in the water, he was going down. But he had faith to say, if it's you, Jesus, I'll believe you. If it's you, I'll trust you. And what do you think the other guys in the boat were doing? Peter, what are you saying? Don't be ridiculous. If you get out of the boat, there's no way we can get you because the water will take you away. The waves will push us. There's no way. But Peter wasn't looking at what he could see. He was wanting to walk by faith. He knew that if he got in the water, as he had done many times, he was going to sink. But step out in faith? Okay, I'll give this a shot. It doesn't make any sense, but I will follow. 29. Probably the word that... That Peter didn't want to hear. Jesus said, come, come on then. And now it's all, now I got to really step out in faith, right? Because maybe he was waiting to say, no, no, I'll come to you guys. I'll come and save the boat. I'll, I'll be there to rescue you guys. But he says to Peter, come. Which is an amazing thing. And excuse me, verse 29, uh, continuing on. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Now, what do you think was holding him up? There was nothing in the water to hold him up. Nothing. Because he, I mean, water's water. Faith can move mountains, Jesus said. If you have the faith as a grain of mustard seed, just a small amount of faith, you can say to this mountain or to this tree, incredible things can happen through faith. In Hebrews, we read, without, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Jesus was asking Peter to come to him to build up his faith. And we know we have an advantage because we can read the rest of the story and understand the role that Jesus, the, sorry, that Peter played in the day of Pentecost. That he was the strength, he was the stone. But when Peter said, ask me to come, and Jesus said, come, and he got out of that boat and he walked. How do you think he felt? He was probably like, yes, yes, the victory goes to God. And so when we walk by faith sometimes, and God says, let go of the rope, your security, and come to me, what's our reaction? Well, I don't know, Lord. Can you, can you come a little closer and take my hand? Well, that's not what Peter said, because he got out of the boat and he walked, and then... In verse, uh, verse 30, but when he saw the wind, that's Peter, when Peter saw the wind boisterous 
and was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. When Peter has his eyes focused on Jesus, I'm coming to you, Lord. He walked. When he started looking around, he didn't walk anymore. He sank. And it's the key for us to remember that when we're walking in the Lord, we're going to feel the wind. We're going to hear the waves crashing. We're going to feel the wetness of the ocean. It's going to be uncomfortable. But Jesus said, you look to me and I'll, I'll save you. I'll be right there. And when we step out in faith, what's the end of that verse say? Oh, sorry, in verse 31, the next verse. And immediately, Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, Oh, thou little faith, where'd you doubt? <laughs> you think, in, in our own lives, we're thinking, Oh, come on, here, here, let me help you up. Come on, let's get back in the boat. Let me, you know, good job for stepping out in faith. And to Jesus, it was like, man, this was just a small thing, walking on the water, right? I mean, come on, if you would have had a little bit more faith, you and I could have had the 100-yard dash and made it to shore, right? If, if you know, he's made me thinking, but, but Peter stepped out in faith, kept his eyes focused. When we step out in faith, we keep our eyes focused and not get distracted, then we know what happens. The Lord is right there for us to comfort, to give peace. It may be uncomfortable. It probably will be uncomfortable, but God is there to give comfort and peace. First Corinthians chapter two. Oh, I'm sorry. On the way through, let's go to Romans chapter five. Romans five. <clears throat> Verse 23. Faith is an amazing thing because it sometimes can be a bit difficult and be hard and, and be, you know, if, if if Jesus would have said, go out and catch me a hundred fish, fishermen would have thought, that's no problem. We've been doing this all our life. We can do that. No problem. Where's the faith in that? That's their own skill that they've gained through life. When Jesus says, come to me on the water, now you've got us. Romans chapter five, uh, verse one. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Faith is justification. Faith, we're justified by that faith that we have in God. And it only takes a little bit. And by having that faith and being justified, that's where the peace of God comes in our life. In verse 2, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. It's all knitly tied together. It's our obedience. It's our walking by faith. It's our hope in the Lord. It's being obedient. It's the peace that comes from God. It's the justification. That's who we are. Cleansed, washed, justified, saved for the kingdom of heaven. When the Lord comes back. Now we'll go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. A couple more scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. In verse 4. 1 Corinthians 2, 4. This is Paul writing to the church in Corinth. And in verse 4, Paul writes and he says, My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. And our pamphlets say the truth with proof. God is a powerful God, and he wants to work in each and every one of our lives. And he's willing to show his power in our lives. In verse 5, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That's where our faith is, foundation is. Our foundation is being filled with the Holy Spirit. Our foundation is when we're walking along and a trial comes right smack up against us and it's uncomfortable. And we say, I've got to have some prayer for this situation. And prayer goes out. 
in the fellowships throughout the world, in, in our in our fellowship, and in, in, in just a few people, however far it goes. And we pray. That's the power. That's the healing. That those are the miracles. John chapter 20. Getting, we'll finish up, uh, we'll get close to finishing. John 20. Walking by faith is an important thing. John chapter 20 and verse 24. This is a time where Jesus had walked his ministry, was nailed to the cross. He was crucified. He died. God raised him from the dead after the third day. What an amazing, miraculous experience. God raised Jesus from the dead, and then he's walking on the earth now. And he comes and he meets, it comes back to his disciples, and he's talking to them. That's kind of where we're picking up the story. In verse 24, 2024, um, it says here, but Thomas, one of the 12 called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came and talked to them. And the other disciples were therefore said unto him, we have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, except I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. So you heard the old cliche, don't be a doubting Thomas. You know where it comes from, right? But Thomas was doubting. He was saying, okay, I believe in miracles. I've seen the Lord do miracles, but you're saying he's been raised from the dead? Our Savior was raised from the dead? I That's kind of hard for me to believe. Unless I actually see him and put my in touch, I, I can't believe. Down to verse 27. Then said he that is Jesus to Thomas, he says, reach here thy finger and behold my hands and reach forth your hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless, but believe. Don't be faithless, Jesus is saying, believe. In verse 28, and Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God. Okay, I believe you now, I, I, it's undeniable. And then in verse 29, Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because you have seen me, and have believed great. But blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. And that's our mission of good news. That's our gospel. That's the truth that we give to people. God is powerful. Jesus is powerful. And that powerful comes from the Holy Spirit. And he's willing to work in our lives. But we've got to have the faith to step up. We've got to have the faith to go give that good news, but also to receive it when the challenges come against us. So walking by faith, faith is the substance of things hoped for. Without faith, it's impossible to please God because God wants us to trust him. And that's what the crux of the whole manner is. We'll finish up in Acts chapter two. It all begins right here. Once Jesus was crucified and raised from the dead, he had said in Acts chapter 1 to the disciples, go and wait for the promise, which said, he, you've heard of me. Talking about the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2 and in verse 1, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, the 120. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost came to dwell within mankind on that day. Excuse me. Down in verse 16, Peter gets up and he's speaking now. And he says, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last day, says God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Joel prophesied hundreds of years earlier. God's going to pour out his spirit on those that ask him. And Peter is saying, this is the fulfillment of that prophecy right here. And Peter went on to explain a number of other things about Jesus and about the gospel. And finally, the people, the thousands of people that were around about and heard it, would go down to verse 37. And it says now, verse 37, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? 
what shall we do hearing these wonderful things? Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of the forgiveness of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. That's the promise today. That's where we start our walk of faith. And from here, we can move forward. So we've got a powerful experience we've had with God, receiving the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues. That language that we can have, have a conversation with God at any time. He's always there with his ear open. What do you need, son? What do you need, daughter? We pray in the Spirit instantly, right there. That's the power. That's what we have, and all the people say it. Amen. Amen. Amen.